Labākai cienījumie klātasošie turības vadības studenti, absolventi, mūsu kolēģi, draugi, viesi un citi interesenti. Mums ir patiesi liels prieks redzēt jūs šodien tik kupā skaitā mūsu dzimšanas dienā. Un mēs esam ļoti, ļoti gandarīti, ka tieši mūsu 25. dzimšanas dienā turības tradīcija rīkot vies lekcijas ir pārgājusi jaunā tādā startautiskā līmenī, tāpēc mums prieks, ka šodien pie mums viesojas Ilvis kungs. Un pirms es viņam došu vārdu, un mēs varēsim ķerties klāt gaidītē vies lekcijai. Es pavisam īsai uzrunēju došu vārdu mūsu turības attīstības padomes priekšēdētājiem Aigaram Rostovska kungam. Labdien cienījumie klātasošajā. Milzīgs paldies, kad atradāt šodien laiku atbraukt uz turību. Konkurence pietiekam liela. Dziesmu svētki, labs laiks. Bet, kā jau redzam, saturs ir izšķirošs. Tā arī šos 25 gadus. Latvijas tirdzniecības rūpniecības kamera ir izstrādājusi stratēģiju Latvijas attīstībai. Mēs redzam Latviju kā pulcēšanās vieta talantiem. Turība savā ziņā ir daļa no šī procesa. 25 gadi bijuši ļoti dažādi un raibi, bet kopumā ļoti veiksmīgi. Mēs esam šobrīd lielākā privāta augstskola Baltijas valstīs. 25 gadi ir pagājuši, mums ir jāiezīmē ceļš nākamiem 25. Es redzu, ka pēc 25 gadiem turība Studenti skaidrs ziņā būs lielākā augstskola Latvijā. Mums ir daudz citi instrumenti. Mēs attīstīsim savu zīmoli. Zīmoli būs franšīzes, būs citas lietas. Bet tas, kas ir svarīgi, mums jārunā pa vērtībām. Mums jāmāc studentiem domāt. Mums jāmāc vēl labāk studentiem pielietot savu zināšanas praksē. Mums ir jāuztur vide. Tāda vide, kas ir ļoti konkurencipējīga, ērta studentiem, ērta mācībspēkiem. Mums ir jāsāk spēlēt augstāka līgā, arī augstāka izglītībā. Bet īpaši svarīgi ir vērtības. Turības vērtības ir brīvība, uzņēmība ir kompetence. Iespējams, ka mums jādomā vēl pa citām vērtībām, jo to, ko mēs redzam arī mūsdienas sabiedrībā, Cilvēki bieži vien ir labi izglītot, bet ja viņam nav pareizi vērtības sistēmi, tad viņi daudz savu zināšanas pielieto varbūt ne tām lietām, kurām vajadzētu. Jāreiz milzīgs paldies par to, kad atradāt laiku un izbaudiet Ilves kunga lekciju. Mr. Ilves, please, welcome on the stage. Well, labi vakar. Uh, congratulations on 25 years. It's uh, uh, 25 years is a big accomplishment in this part of the world. Uh, there are a lot of countries around here that haven't not even gotten to zero, so you're doing rather well as a university. Um, dear rector, professors, alumni and alumni, students, as we celebrate the 100th anniversaries of the independence of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania this year, it is naturally a time of reflection, an opportunity to think more deeply on where we came from, what we have gone through, and more importantly, all we have been able to accomplish when we are free. And of course, where we are and where we are going. I'm not a fortune teller, so the last is a bit difficult, but I shall try to map the landscape a bit better, to better understand the challenges that lie before us and perhaps offer that we are amidst a great realignment in which, in some ways, a return, a return to something we may not like very much. But first, how do we get here? Well, let us think back a hundred years ago, the Great War, or as we call it now with hindsight, the First World War, was in full swing. And not only, for it was going on right here in our midst. Two weeks and 99 years ago, Estonian volunteers fought, what, <coughs> fought one of their bloodiest battles ever, 
not in Estonia, but in Latvia, in Chesi, or as we call it, Vunnu, or the Germans, Venden. They did not fight against the Latvians, but with them, against the Freikorps, an army of freebooters, pirates, eager to reestablish a colonial territory for themselves here. Day before yesterday, 99 years ago, on the 3rd of July, Estonia, Latvia, and the pro-German provisional government signed the ceasefire of Strasdu Muisa. And tomorrow, 99 years ago, the North Latvian Brigade, a unit formed in Estonia by Latvian Colonel Jorgis Zemitans, entered Riga. So a century ago, history was all around us, in the making. More accurately, our gra great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers made history. History without which we would not be here today, or at least many of us would not. World War I was geopolitically and historically cataclysmic. From our perspective, in terms of long-term influence, perhaps even more than the Second World War. It ushered in a new epoch for our nations, for we live in it still today. It gave our fathers, mothers, grandparents a chance to be born and grow up in relative freedom, a key to our present day. Indeed, the First World War reordered Europe from a continent of centuries-old empires, the Russian, Habsburg, and Ottoman. For hundreds of years, we, along with much of what we today call Eastern Europe and even beyond, be it the Russian, Austro-Hungarian, or Ottoman, lived in empires. In Europe, the collapse, uh, the collapse of empires in World War I gave us our chance as it did from Finland to the Balkans. New nation states were born, or in the case of Lithuania and Poland, reborn. Not only our three countries, Finland and modern hung Hungary, more or less uh, as we know today, came into being. Poland was restored after 140 years of non-existence, and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, today divided into their constituent parts, came onto the world scene. This did not take place in a cultural and social vacuum left after a bloody continental war. We were prepared, much as we were in 1991, something I shall return to later. Ladies and gentlemen, for a century, for, <coughs> for a century, that is the 19th, from Finland down to the Dardanelles, what we call today nations were inspired by two competing and often antagonistic intellectual movements. Both exerted and continue to influence what we are today. One, the Enlightenment preached truth revealed through observation or science. It assumed the existence of natural rights of the individual. The state was a contract between and among free individuals who gave up some of their inherent rights and liberties for collective security, in other words, for police and army, the maintenance of law and order. A universalist movement, meaning its values were held to be universal, applying to all men and later women, everywhere in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia. The Enlightenment was born in France, in England, and Scotland in the work of Voltaire, Diderot, and Montesquieu, John Locke, and Bishop Barclay, in Germany in the work of Immanuel Kant. This intellectual reaction to religious dogma and autocratic rule in the form of the divine right of kings, which we saw all over the empires, led to the American and French Revolution. It lives on as the foundations of Western liberal democracy today, inspiring not only the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, but also our own declarations or proclamations of independence 100 years ago in 1918. The ideas are very similar, the inspirations 
were, ex were common. The Enlightenment concept of the state, the individual in it, and the social contract actually derive from the work of Thomas Hobbes, actually a committed believer in the absolute rule of kings. Hobbes saw humanity as a leviathan, the title of his book, more accurately a beast, and life before government and the state to him was chaos, a war of all against all, as he called it, or to quote him, in such condition there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short." Unquote. You might have heard the last solitary, nasty, brutish, and sh short. This is probably most Hobbes' most famous line. But he was, he was writing to, was one of the first people, uh, persons to try to def uh, define and defend the reason for having a king. Um, but he, did, he came up with the idea of a contract. Uh, it was the, uh, the contract idea that then the Enlightenment thinkers following him took up on. Uh, but to this day, the world that he described, the absence of law, rule of law in a world where international rule does not hold, we call Hobbesian. This, of course, from the perspective of the Enlightenment. As I mentioned, the movement that came later and one of the two intellectual movements that shaped the modern world. The other movement, Romanticism, too, was a reaction, but instead it was a reaction to the Enlightenment or against the Enlightenment, particularly, particularly the Enlightenment's universalist claims that is, that his principles held everywhere and was centered on the individual. Romanticism was born primarily, or took hold first, in Germany, though its spiritual head or founding father, Johann Gottfried Herder, was in fact a Lutheran pastor here in Riga, inspired by the folk songs of Livonians and Letts, um, and came as a result to an altogether different view from the Enlightenment, different than the Enlightenment thinkers of the western part of the continent. Herder, inspired, as I said, by what he discovered here in what is now Latvia, concluded instead that the primary unit and organizing principle of mankind was not the individual, as the Enlightenment thinkers maintained. Rather, it was a group, the nation. The nation, he argued, was created by its poets who created the language and the myths that bind the nat nation together. Thus it was language that created the basic unit, the nation, which is why we can view Herder as the father of modern nationalism and indeed the concept of the nation state. Originally, the romantic nationalism of Herder and his disciple, Garlieb Merkel, who was born, lived, and died here in Latvia, was a liberal, arguing that nations, too, had rights. Herder and Merkel celebrated not the equality of individuals, but the equality of the nation, a fairly radical idea when the German upper classes here thought of Letts and Estonians as undeutsch, that is, non-German, not even deigning to give us the benefit of a nationality. For us, it was the opposite. Estonians at least called the elite Saksat, which is synonymous with the Estonian word for, for a German. Herder recorded, in written form of course, the folk songs of the Letts, the Leaves, and the Estonians to argue that each culture had its own worth, no more or less in its aboriginal form, than the worth of any other culture. Merkel went beyond that to argue the treatment of our peoples by the German masters was unconscionable, calling on the Russian czar to help us and to, in some way, hold the Germans back. 
The ideological thrust of Herder was, of course, not to stand up for our people. It was to inspire Germans to look at their own culture and turn away from the universalism of the Francophile court of Frederick the Great. In fact, the court of the German emperor spoke French and to take pride in German culture, rejecting the Enlightenment's disregard for national culture and its emphasis on the individual. These two streams, the Enlightenment and Romanticism, of course, developed more pathological forms. From the Enlightenment, we also got Marxism, a universalist doctrine that did away with the importance of the individual and placed economic class at its center. But it was universalist. Romanticism and romantic nationalism metamorphosed from an ethnographic and aesthetic movement celebrating language and national folk culture into, the, in some places at least, the nationalism of superiority. Indeed, racial superiority in some cases eschewing Herder's liberal idea of the equality of all cultures in favor of a hierarchy of superior and inferior nations, culminating, of course, in the ideology of Nazism. Neither of these intellectual streams was especially appreciated, of course, by the empires. Individual rights, the equality of all men, were hardly approved of by autocratic czars, kaisers, or sultans. Nor did empires appreciate nations representing, as they did, vociferous and centrifugal tendencies from the imagined, imagined universalism of an empire. Empires were universalist with regard to nations, though often assuming the obvious to the ruler's mind, the superiority of the ruling nation. Other nations, subjects within the empire, simply failed to understand the ruling nation's superiority and occasionally wished to separate. Empires were also averse to individual equality based as they were on a ruling hereditary aristocracy with greater rights and privileges than the rest of the citizenry. In our part of the world, Estonia and Latvia, so influenced politically, culturally, and economically by the German ruling class, these two streams, the Enlightenment and the Romantic, however, commingled. For both movements, the concept of the fundamental unit of societal organization, the Enlightenment's individual, as well as Romanticism's nation, were oppressed. As individuals, we had neither freedom of speech, thought, or associations, nor political rights. As nations, although we did not e often even think of ourselves as nations, we had no cultural or linguistic rights. Indeed, we did not even exist. We were just the Undeutsch. This was the environment in which our literary societies and later national epics, Las Places and Kalaviboeg, were born our choral societies and then song festivals, our struggle for a literary language and for elementary schooling in our own, not the German language. Two other developments also turned out to be crucial to our striving for and achieving our independence a century ago. The development of what we today call civil society and the rise of a native urban middle class. These two are also strongly tied to each other. If for centuries before manumission, that is being freed from serfdom, in the period of 1816 to 1819 in Estonia, Livonia, and Kurland, we were serfs tied to the land unable to move, who, suddenly <coughs> who could suddenly freely associate beyond the manor's boundary. They, we could move to cities. This, in turn, required us to have unique identities, to have, therefore, last names. We became persons. Ultimately, some 30 years later, in 1849, we were even permitted to buy baronial land. Given liberty, the freedom to strive for what we wanted, people from our nations began to do well. Suddenly, alongside middle-class Germans, you would find successful Estonians and Latvians. Successful farms, 
appeared alongside baronial estates that in fact were having a hard time surviving outside the feudal order. And dissatisfied with having to speak a foreign language in their own country, Estonians and Latvians began to organize activities in their own languages. Copying the German tradition, we began to organize choral societies and then, thence song festivals, and I might say with, this, with the song festival going on this week in Latvia, it was a tradition that was German, but it's died out in Germany. There are no song festivals, real, well, not real song festivals, I mean, they, but they don't have them anymore. I mean, little ones, yes. We have the big ones, see. <laughs> Wanting entertainment in their own languages, the better off, Estonians and Latvians collected money and established national theaters. And this, by the way, again, is something done elsewhere. The, there's an entire book by Carl Deutsch called Nationalism and, and Social Communication about how the Czech National Theater was born precisely in the same way as in Latvia and Estonia, where businessmen, or the bourgeoisie, uh, decided we don't want to go to theater. We want to be entertained, but we want to be entertained in our, in our home language, not in German, and thus across across the, uh, the empires, be it the Austro-Hungarian or Russian in our cases, we saw the rise of national theaters. Demands for education in our own languages took off, though this met with less success in the Russification campaigns of czars Alexander II and the III. And here again we see the commingling of our Enlightenment and Romantic heritages. We wanted education, we wanted equality, and especially equality of opportunity, implicitly questioning the aristocracy's claim to superiority and greater rights, key principles of the Enlightenment. Yet true to the Herderian Romantic tradition, it was often cast in the call for national equality, for recognition of the rights of the nation, not the individual. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the intellectual and social context in which our societies found themselves in World War I, when three empires, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman, along with a rising power, Germany, found themselves at war. A war that made no sense, had no rational rationale other than that everyone seemed to want one, it was not an ideological war, at least in the beginning, except that in the West, allied against Germany, the Austro-Hungarians and Ro Ottomans were the countries of the Enlightenment, the UK, France, and later the original country to be founded on the ideas of the Enlightenment, the United States. As this is the 100th anniversary of our independence, there is enough coverage of events from a century ago that so I shan't dwell on them except to talk about the context. The First World War's longest standing result, which lasts to this day, was the collapse of empire in Europe. From the Russian Empire, we see Armenia in alphabetical order, Armenia, Estonia, Finland, Georgia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine, even if however so briefly as independent states. From the Austro-Hungarian Empire, <coughs> Czechoslovakia, the Kingdom of Serbia, and the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. Not all survived. Armenia, Georgia, and Ukraine lost their independence in fairly short order. All but Finland lost de facto independence some 20 years later. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the subsequent, and I should add arbitrary and imperialist, partition of Ot the Ottoman possessions in the Arab world along the lines of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, we live with to this day in the ongoing conflicts of the Middle East. If you know anything about the Middle East, the borders of the Middle East were drawn as a result of World War I, and the conflicts we see, uh, are largely the result of those borders. In fact, basically the borders of, of the Middle East are about as arbitrary and often nonsensical as the borders of what was Soviet Central Asia drawn by Stalin. They made no sense, but they were there and they are to this day.
It is important to keep all this in mind when we think solely in terms of our own independence. We live in a world created by the first wave of decolonialization in the modern era. We are not objects of study in the hip, trendy, and largely Marxist-Leninist field of post-colonial studies, the ac academic study of the legacy of colonialism and imperialism, though I believe we should be, especially in the aftermath of the Soviet-Russian imperialism in Eastern Europe as a result of the Second World War. The United States' particular role in the birth and establishment of the swath of new nations between Western Europe and Russia is especially important, stemming from President Woodrow Wilson's plan for the post-First World War order. Wilson recognized that the empires that had ruled Europe for the past centuries could no longer do so. Moreover, one empire had turned into a bloodthirsty anti-capitalist dictatorship, worse than the one that it had succeeded. Woodrow Wilson's plan, or objectives, for the post-war order were spelled out in his 14-point speech before the U.S. Congress in January of 1918. It lives with us to this day. Indeed, one precept the right of self-determination of nations has become in our minds a, a natural right, right, though as such it is only a century old. It was not just a speech about us. It was a speech whose core ideas have largely motivated first U.S. and later also European foreign and domestic policy, perhaps until just the last year or two. Peacetime disarmament, open and liberal trade became a standard goal of U.S. and, as I said, later European foreign and trade policy for a century. The principle of self-determination of nations was enshrined in the Atlantic Charter, though observed more in the reach in the case of Eastern Europe. It is enshrined in the U.N. Uh, Charter after the Second World War. Uh, and is a principle I think most Western countries believe in. These days, this year, as we celebrate our own people's courage and spirit from a century ago, it behooves us to understand whence it came, what inspired our forefathers, and that what was born a hundred years ago was part of a far larger, more massive trend in history that was allowed to come into being through the crucible of a terrible war. Ladies and gentlemen, independence fought for and defended is why we are here, still here today. And for two reasons, often overlooked in our focus on the actual events at the time, where we plot day by day who fought what, whom, where. The first is the simple fact that we are alive. Uh, and I think about this almost every year around Independence Time. For had we not achieved and maintained our sovereignty through the 1930s, Latvians and Estonians would have emerged at best as a minority, an ethnic curiosity on our own territories, like so many forgotten peoples in the USSR or in Russia today. We'd have our folk costumes, Tourists would visit our open-air museums and hear about our strange non-Russian language and culture, cultures so lovingly preserved by the authorities. The sad truth is that without achieving independence, we would have become the victims of the extermination of Baltic non-Russians by the Soviet regime under Stalin. Those of us still left when the Germans invaded in 1941, would have simply done everything to simply escape to the West, like the refugees in Syria today. Looking at the fate of the Ingrians from the, the Leningrad area, Ingrians are Estoni cousins of the Estonians and the Finns. In fact, their language is kind of in between our two funny languages. If you look at the fate of the Ingrians in the Leningrad area, which is where they lived, as well as our own Estonian and Latvian compatriots who remained in Russia after 1920 
realized their fate was to suffer genocide. At the end of the First World War, some 150,000 Ingrians, co cousins of the Finns and Estonians who lived around Leningrad, had no place to go. They had no homeland other than where they, where they were. Their language, as I mentioned, is somewhere between Finnish and Estonian. They are close to both. Before the outbreak of the Nazi-Soviet hostilities in 1941, a third or more of the 150,000 Ingrians had been shot or deported. By the end of the war, it is estimated by scholars that 80% of the Ingrians had been repressed, that is, killed or deported. At the demise of the Soviet Union, around 50,000, or a third of the Ingrians from the founding of the U period of time of the founding of the USSR, still identified themselves as such, but the absence, but due to the absence of any native language schools, few still spoke the language. In short, we must keep this in mind in thinking of our position today when we use our own languages day to day and in the European Union. Without independence 100 years ago, our fate would have been that of the Ingrians, which we would speak to our own compatriots in Russian. And in fact, our own compatriots suffered in the same way. Some 250,000 Estonians remained in the USSR after Estonian independence. Between 1936 and 1938, 11,000 Estonians from the Leningrad area were arrested, of whom 75% were shot. Another researcher has concluded that some 9,000 Estonians were murdered by the Soviets simply because they were Estonians. And Latvians fared no better, in fact worse, some 16,500 Latvians were murdered in the Soviet Union before the Second World War, which given our nation's relative sizes allows us to conclude that this was a systematic process, a percentage of each. Given this horror, let us then extrapolate and ask what would have happened to Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians had we not fought for and achieved our independence? What would be left of us had our forefathers not fought and won 100 years ago? A second long-term result of establishing, <coughs> establishing and maintaining our independence that I believe was crucial for the re-establishment of our independence and what is what we uh, today would call resilience, our ability to withstand Soviet rule and survive as nations. It was the myth, myth not in the sense of something, uh, myth in the sense of something we believe in, not myth as something false. The myth that when we decided things ourselves, we did much better than under the Soviets. Not that anyone doubts this today, but it was the rejection of the idea that the communists were kulturträger, bringers of culture, that allowed Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians to look back look back in their history and say, then it was better. Oddly enough, it was Josef Vissarionovich Stalin himself, in a letter to Lenin during the debate of the early 20s as to how far the Soviet Union might expand, uh, it was Stalin who maintained the USSR can never include states that had had their own flags and had its embassies abroad. At the time, the issue was more about the Soviet of Bavaria. Uh, there was such a thing as the Soviet of Bavaria um, and in, in Germany. Uh, and the question was, do, do we include them in the Soviet Union? And Stalin said no. Um, but nonetheless, Stalin was right. Once a people have tasted independence, they don't forget it. The memory of what it was like is passed on from generation to generation until it is realized again. This letter from Stalin to Lenin, of course, was later uh, suppressed, and of course, the USSR did become an imperialist predator state, but at least, you know, you can always appeal to Joseph Stalin as the big authority. And this is why our hopes and struggles to regain our independence could never be quashed. This is why we both do not our date our independence to 1991, but to 1918. We established it, we had it, it was taken away from us. Our forefathers suffered for it, 
So we have remained true to their ideals, remembered their sacrifices, and vowed to restore, to take back what was stolen from us, because it is ours. Ladies and gentlemen, independence itself, when it was achieved 100 years ago, was more difficult than expected. For many, a letdown, as we saw too after the reestablishment of independence. Independence was something our elites had wanted, but not necessarily something they had prepared for. Our population as a whole had fought the Bolsheviks and the German Freikorps less for the idea of independence and more for self-preservation. In the case of Estonia, my, from my personal experience, one veteran officer of the War of Independence told me about 30 years ago that his troops had volunteered to fight because news had spread to the countryside of the butchery and atrocities committed by communists on the territories that they had occupied. Bloodbaths where hundreds of civilians were shot and tortured in Tartu, mainly. He said, for these men and boys who volunteered from the countryside, it was a war of survival, survival of their families, not an ideal or a dream of urbanized intellectuals. Thus, when independence came, we had ideals, but little idea of how to realize them. In the 1920s and 30s, having our own flags was no longer enough. The romanticism of having our own nation states remained, but the declarations of liberal democracies in our countries was poorly fulfilled. We knew what we wanted, but were not necessarily prepared for the rough and tumble of politics. Corruption had been something up till then that was done by a foreign ruling elite above us, not something we engaged in ourselves. Yet ruling ourselves, Estonians, I won't speak for others, found themselves as tempted as well. Parliaments were weak or ineffectual. Rule of law was as well. The idea of constitutional guarantees of individual rights over time became subordinate to the rule of the state, paving the way for authoritarian rule. Though rather mild by practices in the rest of Europe in that era, it was authoritarian. Democracy was weaker and less appealing than what our citizens had hoped for in the heady days of a century ago. The true strength of liberal democracies in our part of the world was put to the test in 1939, 1940. The results of those tests we live with to this day. And it has haunted and motivated me ever since I began to study seriously why I was living in a foreign land, speaking a different language at home than the language spoken around me. In 1939, was, as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, the agreement that led to our own demise, the USSR presented Finland an ultimatum. Cede part of your territory or we invade. The Bal Baltic states were given an ultimatum to base the Soviet army and the governments agreed. Nine months later, coups d'etat were carried out in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania using artificial popular fronts assisted by Soviet troops and agents brought into the countries. We all know that about our part, but any similarities to the takeover of Crimea in 2014 or the actions in what for a while was called Novorossiya are, are of course purely coincidental. Finland, however, was a parliamentary democracy, a functioning parliamentary democracy. The political leadership, the government, consulted with the parliament to discuss and ask for approval of its rejection of Soviet demands, knowing that this could lead to war. And the parliamentary parties, the coalition and the opposition supported the government position not to give in, also knowing that that meant war. In our countries, our leaders were of more dubious democratic legitimacy. They made decisions without consulting a freely elected parliament. They believed they were wise enough to decide for our people, for our parents and grandparents and great-great-grandparents. 
This is worth keeping in mind today, as we see the same tendencies in a number of countries considered to be liberal democracies. Democratic parliamentary oversight is passed by, or parliaments become rubber stamps. The constant trashing and belittling of Europe's parliaments by the media, especially the click-hungry media of the digital era, doesn't help. Tacitly encouraging and promoting the view that if only we had a strong hand. I cannot but be amazed that countries in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, who really should know better, step willingly once again on the same rake, as we seem to say in our languages. Ladies and gentlemen, I have little to say about the Soviet period, even though our country spent half of the 20th century imprisoned in it, but I think we all know about it. But prisoners, moreover, have no intellectual schools of thought, except the ones that they are permitted. They have no say in the way they live. Their aspirations, unless it is to serve the prison, can find no expression. But the walls of this prison began to crack more seriously, as we know, some 30 years ago. The national romantic dream of independence again looked plausible. The foundations of the Soviet edifice, having rotted for decades, was on the verge of crumbling. As I said, it was, <coughs> it, for us, it was a dream of restoration of an earlier reality. National self-determination, after all, had worked once. We had had our flags and embassies abroad, as Stalin had warned Lenin. We already had had our national awakening 130 years earlier, so we didn't really have to do that again. We had realized we were nations, or made ourselves into them, and we had been able to create viable, even if flawed, nation states. Missing or weakly present at the time, though, uh, this is in the late 80s, was the Enlightenment strand in our liberation movements. Some found it difficult to understand that liberty was not only national, but also individual. I recall fighting from my perch in Munich in summer 1991, a, a draft journalism law before that was going before what was then called the Supreme Council of Estonia. The drafters saw nothing wrong, and indeed they thought they were progressive in limiting the punishment for violations of the journalism law to limiting the time of prohibitions against publishing. In other words, if a journalist violated the law, he would not be allowed to publish for a set number of days or weeks. This was a progressive idea of the national liberation movement. <laughs> More broadly, I spoke with many opposition figures of the time, not only from the Baltic states, but also from elsewhere in communist-occupied Estonia, or Europe, sorry, sorry, all starts with a knee, you know. Uh, elsewhere in communist-occupied Europe, and was struck how little the Enlightenment tradition infused their thinking. There were exceptions, of course, most notably Václav Havel, but many, too many, found Western liberalism a trivial, or then at best, a secondary concern when compared to the fate of their respective nation. Understandably so, I should add, for this alien and humane communism had been imposed from without and was directed against their nations. Individuals were persecuted for standing up for their nations. If anything, communist rule, its faux, inter faux internationalism of Druzhba Narodov, friendship of the people, all enforced through the risible nonsense term language of international communication, meaning Russian, of course, created a national reaction. All the more so among those nations whose histories for the past 800 or more years have belonged to an altogether different cultural and intellectual space Indeed, even a different alphabet. Yeah, we did this selectively. This cultural space we yearn to return to, this Europe so many nations under communist rule wanted to join, also counts as its foundation today, the Enlightenment. This is all the more true since the, the post-Second World War settlement, where adherence to liberal democracy became 
a precondition for inclusion within this concept of Europe. And that's where we are, to Europe. This continent, since the Second World War, having learned the lessons of the 20s and 30s, opted to create its future organizations, to base its future organizations on the Enlightenment. Respect for human rights, rule of law, free and fair and contested, that is to say, democratic elections. I don't want to belabor this point, but as the institutional carriers of the idea of the West, NATO and e the EU have been the best thing for the European continent since the Enlightenment writers of the 18th century, putting into practice what were philosophical and theoretical ideas from 200 years ago. And to judge from the economic and security success of the post-war era, these ideas turned out to work far, far better than anyone else could foresee and far, far better than any of the competition. The foundations, of course, are to be found, the foundation for security, of course, are to be found in a short work, Perpetual Peace, from 1975 by the greatest of luminaries of the Aufklärung, the German Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant. He argued that the best solution to guarantee peace and avoid war was for republics, as he called them, to form a federation and that this would prevent them from going to war with one another. He, of course, was speculating. As it turns out, he was right. It was singularly important to Kant that these be republics, that is to say, states that held regular elections for their rulers, had constitutions to guarantee the obligations of the rulers to the citizens, in short, what we would call today democracies. Here we find the contemporary mantra, which in fact remains true, namely that democracies do not go to war with one another. Indeed, that has been the experience of war ever since the blood, <coughs> the experience of Europe ever since the bloodiest war in the history of Europe. It bears also mentioning that the emergence of the Romantic movement, initiated by Heather, was in large part a reaction against Immanuel Kant. In the realm of security, the world, and especially the transatlantic space, has moved slowly but consistently toward a Kantian ideal. The UN Charter of 1945 forbade changes, uh, forbade changing borders through military force or threat of use of military force. In Europe, the Helsinki Final Act of 1975 enshrined this as a principle for the continent. The Paris Charter of the then CSCE, later OSCE, signed on by all member states, said that each country had the right to decide its own security arrangements. Bluntly put, if a country wished to join NATO, the only impediments would be the country's own limitations. No one would have a veto over another country's choices. The security of Europe allowed also the economic success of Europe. With democracy planted at home and its eastern border secured, Europe could proceed to dismantle the historical barriers to commerce through the common and later single market, paving the way also to the free movement of people and labor internally within the borders of Europe, one of the great aspirations and hopes of our own citizens here in the Baltic states. To achieve this security and success, we too had to join the European Union and NATO. Independence, especially the pre-war idea of independence as isolation, we realized was not enough and it would not work. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of this European liberal democratic ideal, indeed its success the worldwide, even before the collapse of communism, led Francis Fukuyama in 1989 to publish his essay that later became a book, The End of History, a work that unfortunately was immediately attacked through a simplistic and often willful misinterpretation of the title. The book does reflect the general optimism of the era. Liberal democracy and its handmaiden, the free market economy, had won the ideological battle. 
While many countries in 1989 remained illiberal autocracies, there was no longer a debate as to whether autocracy offered a viable alternative or a better life for its citizens. That debate was over. In, indeed, autocracies chose instead to play democracy, fake it, but not to dispute it. This was the world our countries entered with the collapse of communism and authoritarian rule to be replaced by a quarter, quarter century of the end of history. It was the inexorable march toward an ultimate and ineluctable neo-Hegelian triumph of liberal democracy. These were, I believe, among the most optimistic 25 years of Western history. Democracy, we believed, had won for good. We had a peace dividend. Military spending was slashed. NATO had to go in the title of a famous piece in the journal Foreign Affairs, out of area or out of business, meaning there were no more threats on the continent. Those were elsewhere, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. But Europe, East and West, would unite. Russia was our friend. It was peace, love, and Woodstock, at least for the Western world, for liberal democracy, and market economies. Emerging or re-emerging as independent countries, the Baltic states, because of their histories, decided they were not taking any chances. We'd gladly take the end of history because we'd overdosed on it. Thus, we strove to join both Kantian structures, the EU and NATO. When Estonia was in the middle of the accession process, I was often asked, I was foreign minister at the time, why join, or more typically, why not just NATO? Well, the simple answer is that only by, only by joining the EU would a number of large European countries assent to our accession to NATO. So you couldn't really have, you couldn't get NATO without the EU, even though many wanted that, including my wife. What is different about these two from the point of view of the efforts of the applicants is in the nature of the transformation. Joining NATO is about getting in shape, doing enough push-ups and sit-ups to fit into a suit of armor provided by the Allies and having to pay 2% of GDP a year to keep it. In other words, it's an insurance policy for which we are asked to pay a premium for its maintenance. The EU, on the other hand, is a full cure with the result that a country becomes a full democracy and market economy with access to the richest and largest market in the world. To achieve that, you need to take over a large body of laws, the acquis communautaire, for the country to function or to be allowed to function within the union. This is equivalent to replacing step by step all of one's old, brittle, arthritic, and osteoporotic bones with new stainless steel bones and joints. You can't change your, ske your skeleton all at once, thus the long step-by-step -step process. Emerging from this long procedure, however, we are far stronger and capable of hang handling the rigors of a modern European state. In joining the EU and NATO, we formally concluded the process of what was a long-standing myth, again, a myth in the sense of a fundamental belief system, a myth of our peoples, one that we'd had ever since the middle of the 19th century, the myth of the return, a return to the fold of the family of European nations. Whether we previously had belonged as anything but as colonized peoples is a different matter, but coming from <clears throat> for the first time from the autocratic Russian Empire and a second time from the Soviet Union or, Rus or Russian Empire version 2.0, it was and remains a vital, indeed fundamental axiom as of our existence as nations. And in fact, at least it's in the Estonian Declaration of Independence. We want to rejoin the family of European cultured nations. Note also the Herderian romantic idea that we are equals to other European nations, not lesser cultures, never mind the snobism and patronizing of those who joined earlier. Yet to return, as it were, we had to prove our equality not as nations in the romantic tradition, which is where we came from, 
but as equals in adherence to Enlightenment ideals that stress respect for individual rights and freedoms. Whether we were Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, whether we had been liberal democracy since the 18th century or only since the collapse of communism, that was all irrelevant. We asked to be uh, simply, and indeed, were evaluated as equals, more or less. This approach, I should add, runs against much of the rhetoric of the 1990s when we claimed we have always belonged to Europe, a strictly geographical statement that is sim simply trivial for the purposes of the European Union. Similarly, from all up and down what had been the communist glacis in the East, we would hear arguments, and some of my, uh, some of my compatriots made the same, we were the last bulwark against the barbarians in the East. We defended you to the, to the West, implying that this entitled a priori our inclusion in an organization of liberal democracies. As one can imagine, neither argument carried much weight than the structures we used to join, uh, wish to be members of, nor does it carry any weight today when I hear similar arguments from other countries hoping to join. For us, this transformation was driven by the requirements the EU and NATO set for us, which as often is the case, were more stringent than for the founders themselves. Given the sometimes understandable, other times not so pure reservations of so-called old members from those organizations, both incorporated new democratization requirements to be fulfilled as preconditions for accessions. We were former communist countries, Interestingly, I should add here in passing that <coughs> I've not <coughs> read anyone ever speak about former fascist countries. Indeed, 27 years after, or we're 27 years uh, after our independence, 14 years after joining the EU and NATO, we are still often described in the press as elsewhere as former Soviet republics. But I think about that, I go, in 1972, when I was an undergraduate at Columbia, 27 years after the end of World War II, 16 years after Germany, Germany joined NATO and the EU, I saw no sentences, I recall no sentence about German being the, Germany being the former Nazi Reich. Sorry, didn't see it. Nonetheless, we set out to fulfill what was required of us. In the case of NATO, it was civilian control of the military, a requirement most obviously not applied previously, as in the case of Portugal, Greece, and Turkey. In addition, we had to go through an unprecedented multi-year map or membership action plan that no member had to go through before us. The EU, wary, wary of incorporating new members that wished to join after rejecting communist rule, adopted the Copenhagen criteria that required national institutions to be capable of guaranteeing democratic governance and human rights. This meant, as we know, constant oversight. Again, in our case, bordering on insolence by Max von der Stuhl, who, acting more like a viceroy, demanded that Estonia and Latvia, uh, demanded of Estonia and Latvia what a number of so-called old European countries would hardly countenance. But we complied. We are rational, and in hindsight, looking at the world around us, I would say rather wise to have done so. Be that as it may, in a quod licet jovi non licet bovi world, that's what is allowed to Jupiter is not allowed to the bull. Uh, in that kind of world, small nations, have been used to that for as long as there has been written history. The promise of membership in these organizations, in fact, prodded us to follow these requirements despite that old adage, and for the better, I would argue. By and large, our institutions are stronger and better equipped to deal with the challenges of democracy than in many other countries, but especially those that in the wake of communist collapse failed to adopt liberal democracy or the rule of law. So years ago, in fact, to be depressed, I looked at the Freedom House Index of Freedom Ratings among the countries that Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, my employer a quarter century ago, or more now, broadcast to. 
To my dismay, I discovered that 25 years after the wall, 80% of the populations of what was the RFERL broadcast area lived in countries deemed either partially free or completely unfree. 80%. And what does this say about the end of history? Today, I'm dismayed to worry about the West more broadly. Christopher Walker, Vice President of Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment of Democracy, was one of the better scholars of what is going on with democracy, has spoken of Vladimir Putin's rollback of the Enlightenment, the fundamentals of the West, not only the fundamental freedoms, but also of democracy, rule of law, and separation of church and state. If we abandon our core values, or compromise with values antithetical to liberal democracy, or as has happened in much of the once communist world, fail even to adopt these core values, we shall end up back in a Hobbesian world, a war of all against all, a life nasty, brutish, and short. This is where domestic politics runs into foreign policy. When you ad abandon liberal democratic ideals at home, an idealistic or liberal foreign policy becomes meaningless. If a trade deal is more important than international rules of the game, then the latter falls apart. Realpolitik rules, or if realpolitik rules, we are back to Thucydides' Melian dialogues in his Peloponnesian War. Quote, where the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. One only need to look around at the rest of the countries to emerge from what the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union for proof of how important these institutional requirements are to ensure fundamental rights and freedoms. But nonetheless, it was indeed a case of double standards. We were asked to do more than old Europe had. As one Western European diplomat answered me 20 years ago when <clears throat> as foreign minister I pointed out how his country did not follow what we were required to, he said, we're in the club, you are not. Yet, if we look back on our history, we also see that had we followed these same precepts 80 years ago, we would have been in those clubs from the very beginning. Anyway, be all that as it may, Eastern Europe largely managed to fulfill the requirements of membership in NATO and the EU, and in 2004, we joined as full members, and I still count that as one of the most important and substantial achievements of our nations in their history. Ladies and gentlemen, we joined, but the success of accession was short-lived. In the post-Cold War era, we had become accustomed to the post-historical status quo, to the end of history. What we, meaning countries, the countries that had just finished a difficult 15-year odyssey to rejoin Europe, hoped for, was a new normality. That is to say, to be participants in the norms of behavior, be they in foreign affairs or security, or in following the rules of government fiscal policy or in responsibility. And no sooner did we join than the world around us began to unravel, and it wasn't because of us. Of course, Thank heavens we did join when we did. Thank the heavens that we did all the work that it took to be accepted. We need only to look at those who failed to undertake the necessary reforms and who for whatever reasons did not push themselves to reform enough to join the liberal democratic fold. Neither in the EU nor NATO today, they live precisely in a Hobbesian world of might makes right and international law means nothing. While few will say publicly, though some do, the Fukuyama quarter century is drawing to a whimpering close. It is no longer about the victory of liberal democracy, it is a scramble to protect what we have both abroad and at home. Enlargement, though not dead in the mortar, say some, is barely afloat. But NATO at least is back to protecting its own. Back in area, back in business. The peace dividend is spent, and indeed we borrowed off it more than necessary, and now countries have to recapitalize, and that's one of the core problems that 
many European countries have with the US. History, however, is creeping back. Despite winning the argument, liberal democracy has not turned out to be the default option. We hear that the European project, its prioritizing of rights and freedoms, has failed. That what we need is illiberal democracy. Indeed, we heard that from a prime minister of an EU country. And indeed, it turns out you can, for the short term, at least enjoy a free market economy with authoritarian rule. All you need is a West that still maintains rule of law for itself, but is weak on, for example, money laundering legislation. In this new world, Europe needs less to fear from invasion, but not because the threat has gone uh, away. The digital era, which I would date from the arrival of the smartphone and the resultant explosion in the use of social media, also means you no longer need to invade countries to get what you want. This is something we can, in fact, do something about. Democracy in the digital era is susceptible to manipulations we could not imagine until a decade ago and only became aware of in the past two, three years. False stories originating elsewhere are spread by us. Indeed, research shows that we are more likely to share or retweet emotional but most unlikely true stories, untrue stories than the more boring true stories. Where once we could rely on an editor to decide if something is credible or not, today even reputable, reputable sources such as the BBC and The Guardian have been faked on the web. So what you see there is not The Guardian, nor is the story you see there true. So it is up to us to be more critical when anyone and everyone has become an editor and anyone and everyone can put something out there. It's up to us to see whether we share it or retweet it or, sh or, give it or talk about it to our friends. Here, precisely because of our liberal democratic traditions, we cannot rely on government solutions. We need to take greater responsibility. We need to keep in mind that it's not necessarily a foreign invasion we need to be concerned about, which is why I'm less worried about NATO than the kind of subversion we have seen in elections, in referenda, and political conflicts in Europe. We've seen it in France, the Netherlands, and Czechia this year, and the standoff between Catalonia and Madrid, and of course in the US, these attempts at digital subversion have been and can you continue to be even better documented and are in the news all the time. But from the point of view of the authoritarian, it is far, far cheaper and moreover far more useful to subvert liberal democracies. If you get a friendly government, elected governments that do not impose sanctions or remove them, governments that conclude geopolitically beneficial gas pipelines, Governments that allow you to launder your money, who needs to invade? Indeed, I would argue that authoritarian regimes, uh, by necessity, that by necessity of survival, suppress the opposition, cannot afford rule of law for its own citizens, but desperately requires rule of law elsewhere to ensure and preserve their stolen riches. For after all, if you make money through theft and with the connivance of the state, how can you be sure that that same state does not turn around and steal your stolen money from you? Without rule of law, you can't. So this is a symbiotic relationship that authoritarian regimes have with the West. These regimes cannot stand the moralizing of the West, yet they need the West to maintain their riches. The West, on the other hand, gladly accepts the ill-gotten money of the leadership of the countries they preach to, and in order to do so, chafe uncomfortably under the strictures of their own morality that require them to follow their own rules. This is the moral quandary the liberal democratic world finds itself in today. The moral compass of the Cold War is gone. 
today, former chancellors, campaign managers of successful presidential campaigns, financiers of Brexit, can seemingly count on getting away with it. They get away with it because these same people have found that appealing to our more atavistic ideas of the nation, beset and threatened by outsiders, attention can be diverted. We see this across the West, from the US to the UK to the continent, and even in our own countries. Optimism has been replaced by fear, a loss of direction, Mainstream parties in Europe fear to be swept aside by a populist flood and make compromises on the core values of Europe. Voters fear to lose the, eco the gain economic gains of the post-war era. Extremists offer solutions where basic human rights, constitutional protections, even liberal democracy are deemed secondary. And at the very, from the very top, the romantic Herderian notion of the nation as supreme over even basic democratic norms has returned to the debate, even despite the lessons of what this led to in the 1930s. And opinion polls evermore support the extremes and the heavy hand. Liberal democracy, perhaps then, has not triumphed at all. This, moreover, has allowed Russia to go rogue occupying foreign territory, buzzing NATO ships in international waters, the post-World War Treaty basis of the transatlantic security order after the invasion of Georgia in 2008 and the Anschluss of Crimea in 2014, the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, the Paris Charter remain smoldering. We see saber rattling, we witness an ongoing war in Europe itself, where it takes the Foreign Affairs Council of the European Union a year to go beyond expressing grave concern about an invasion on, in the territory of Europe and to talk about Russian troops, and to, a year to begin to talk about Russian troops rather than separate forces in Ukraine. In the US, the bulwark of security on the European continent, the president and his party dismiss concerns about Russia Russian aggression, fo focusing instead on trade issues with the EU and what turns out to be a decline, declining immigration from the South. We read that NATO is supposedly worse than NAFTA. Judging by the tenor and content of this rhetoric, one begins to wonder who is the ad adversary and who is the ally. Naturally, this creates a huge deal of security even in big, rich European countries with plenty of buffer room, that is to say us, between them and an aggressive, revanchist Russia. What then do you expect we should do? Already since 2014, we have read articles in the Western press claiming we are next, and at home, arguments we left behind in the early 90s. It's a mistake to rely on the US. We should try to appease Russia and so forth are returning. We are unsure, and my last page is missing. Uh, we are unsure what to do, how to cope. As you can imagine, shit. I have my computer, please. We are sure, <coughs> we are unsure what to do. As you can imagine, these arguments at home as well as in the... Uh, thank you, Paldies. What are we supposed to do? Recognize the seizure of Crimea and occupation of the Donbass? The <coughs> Baltic states, with our history, should we accept these things? Do we believe that by abandoning the idea of NATO and the EU, we are better off? Do we relax rule of law? pass off the murder of opponents of Russia in European countries so as not to pass up lucrative contracts. Meanwhile, and the, content, the continent is reeling, where am I? <laughs> All right. Excuse me just for a moment, this is truly embarrassing, but I didn't get the end of my speech. Uh, if I can find. 
Yeah. Meanwhile, the continent is reeling from massive migration in 2015 through porous borders, leading to demands today to close European borders within. H horrific terrorism has hit Paris and Brussels and other European cities. Narrowly averting the collapse of Greece, we now face the imminent exit of the UK. If it is successful, it will spur other vociferous trends in other countries where populist politicians would say, see, you can do well by leaving the EU, which in fact, <coughs> even possibly, might turn out to be true for, a lar for large countries with a sizable domestic market but, and with also a strong military, but certain decline for countries such as ours. Today, a quarter century after the end of the Cold War on our home continent and elsewhere as well, we are amidst transformational change. Amidst transformational change to which we do not know yet how to respond. The only analogy I can think of is the period from the end of, the, of World War II when the West thought victory over Nazism had ushered in a new period of peace and then it turned out it hadn't and a few short years it was necessary for the West to create ex nihil NATO. Today we, the Baltic States, the European Union and NATO, the Western liberal democratic world in general, need to face up to these challenges. Our existence and our existence, far more than <coughs> for larger nations, depends on values. Those same enlightenment liberal democratic values that created the success of the West. The primacy of interests over values, or rather rejection of the idea that the former might have some relevance for the latter, is the authoritarian's view of the world. One Russian politician I recently read in the New Yorker called this politics as ideological philosophical expansion. The alternative, which he was promoting, was politics as business, continuing with values out of the way, everything is tradable. Given our own histories being traded, we know all too well what that means. We know that as small nations, a, re <coughs> a return to might makes right policies in foreign and security spells our doom. We know what a belief in the superiority of one nation over another leads to. We know too, however, that the demographic explosion in Africa, the wars in the Middle East, and the immense gulf between incomes, uh, between, in incomes between Europe and the South, Southeast, and indeed to our East, we must secure our external borders without decreasing the freedom of movement within. This will be our, and especially your, looking at your age, uh, primary challenge in the decades ahead to deal with these threats so that we can maintain the lifeblood of Europe's existence, our liberty and adherence to human rights. We small countries have no choice but to remain true to democratic values both at home and our approach to the world outside. And this is what I ask of you who will lead us into the future as my generation steps aside, as I in fact already have. It is, to thank, it is thanks to our forefathers 100 years ago and a quarter century ago that we realize that we, are, we today are the custodians of the state that those people created. It is our duty to defend it, to remember always what they did. We all are stakeholders in our countries, to take the modern hip term, because it belongs to us but it belongs even more to our children and future generations as well. Hence, our duty. As Ronald Reagan said in 1961, incidentally, when he still belonged to the Democratic Party, and I quote, freedom is never more than one genera generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and hand it on for them to do the same." Unquote. It is a bipartisan challenge. Indeed, it is a national challenge. And it is your challenge 
So I say, good luck. Thank you. Cienījamie klatesušie, ja kādam ir jautājumi Ilves kungam ceļam roku, un mūsu palīgi jums uzreiz arī piedāvās mikrofonu, tur no tuli... Jūs varbūt pieceļaties, lai mēs jūs labāk varam redzēt, kuram ir jautājumi. Un pēc jautājumiem aicināšu nemugas prom, mums būs vēl kāds pārsteigums. Hey, thank you for the lecture. It was amazing. I have for a long time this internal dilemma. Uh, and I think uh, your experience might help me uh, with uh, getting on with it. So it appears to me that uh, patriotism it has a very strong potential and healthy potential for the country. And at the same time, it might be very unhealthy and risky for the whole world. And I'm just curious about your take on the patriotism. What do you think about it? Well, I, patriotism is uh, very important for survival. It's just that you, if you take the attitude that it's that uh, you're better than everyone else, uh, then uh, or rather that others are worse than you, then it inevitably leads to bad results. If you say, "I'm really proud of my country. I think it's really cool. I really like living here, and I think it's the best for me," but you don't say, "Oh, you're Estonian, God." Uh, then um, that's okay, and vice versa. So I don't know. I don't. I don't see the dilemma there, frankly. I mean, the the problem is when you, and as we've seen, sort of coming up in politics, that also when it turns racial, and there is a lot of that in Europe today. Uh, when it's religious, you know, anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic. You know, it used to be used to go around killing people who were Protestant if you were Catholic, and vice versa. But or the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, put an end to that. Uh, but, you know, we still seem to be looking for people who are different in order to hate them. And inevitably it leads to bad things. Uh, and this is why we, you know, you have this, like too many slogans in the European Union, slightly sort of uh, vomit producing, but, you know, diversity is great. But it is. Diversity is good. It's just when you turn to a slogan, people sort of react against it. But, I mean, I'm very proud of Estonia. I don't think Estonians are better than other people. I just think that what we do is cool. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Annette Bitte. Thank you for the wonderful speech. Um, in your speech, initially, you mentioned that one of the preconditions for the Baltic state, Baltic to become states and gain their independence was civic activity. And I was just wondering, uh, what's your stance on the low civic engagement of the youth today, and how do you see uh, the role of youth um, in bringing Europe back to these Enlightenment values in Europe? Thank you. Well, it seems that um, youth seems rather engaged. Um, but, uh, but on the other hand, you could say that not enough, since uh, if you saw the voter participation in the Brexit referendum, it was very low. Uh, and this is and now people are realizing that, uh oh, I mean, I didn't bother to go vote because, uh, you know, why bother to go vote? And then all these people. Uh, who are you know, re retirees uh, who, did, who don't like the EU decided the future for people who are young because the young people didn't vote. And so, I mean, they did, you know, disproportionately voted less than the older people. But 20 years down the line, those young people will be 40 or something, whereas those people who voted to leave won't even be around. Uh, so... You need to do more, and certainly what is important is participating participating in the democratic process. Because if you don't participate, then you shouldn't be surprised when people you don't like so much uh, end up winning. 
Hello. Uh, <laughs> there's really so much that I'd like to ask you, so much that uh, I'd like to debate, but since time Pick is of one. the essence, <laughs> <laughs> that's a my question for you is, does the EU or NATO in general have a plan for Russia after Putin? Well, what happens after he's gone? Well, those are two different things. Well, the first one is easy. I don't think they have a plan at all. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we cannot talk, I mean, it may be more important to say that we shouldn't talk about the EU in that sense. It has whatever plans we make it have. Okay, little Estonia is not going to change the course of the ship, but you go and you may form coalitions, and there are enough like-minded countries in the European Union that if you, if you work with them, you have the power to change things. So it's not like, there is no EU there that, that makes these big decisions. They're our decisions, we make them. Or if people we think are not doing a job, as I personally think the high representative for foreign security policy is not doing a good job, she's only, be, she's only been to Ukraine twice since the invasion, but unless people make noise about it, unless our foreign ministers raise the issue, unless our prime ministers raise the issue, why is it that we have a war, a war in a country that borders three members of the European Union while the high representative for common foreign security policy has gone to Cuba every year. I mean, you go, wait a minute, isn't there something wrong with this? But it's up to us. She's not an independent entity. She is put there by us. We agree to it. Uh, and it's our responsibility as, and our responsibility of our elected representatives to raise these issues. If you don't, well, then people will do whatever they want according to their own sort of political agendas. But so it's up to us. In terms of what happens after Putin, I don't think we know what's going to happen even next week when it comes to Putin. Well, specifically, we don't know what's going to happen on June 16th because we have two, you know, as uh, Donald Rumsfeld said, there are there are uh, no knowns and there are known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns. And it's true. What he said was exactly right, even though people laughed at him. But it's, it's, from the point of view of epistemology, it's completely right. And we have two unknown unknowns meeting on the 16th. Hello. Uh, lovely lovely um, lecture, by the way. Um, <sighs> We haven't got all night. If we had, they would be wonderful because there's lots of questions I've got for you. All I want to say is, 40 odd years ago, I vo voted to join the EU, and two years ago, I voted to leave it. Um, there's lots of reasons why, and you haven't really touched on them, but one word you used all the time tonight was democracy. That is the whole of our argument. Democracy really does not exist anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Plurality and diversity of opinion is... Um, hello. Can you share your opinion about fact that KGB archives is still not published in Latvia? What do you think about it? I know nothing about Latvian domestic politics and I will not go into it under any circumstances because <laughs> because it's an election year, and besides, when I say domestic policy, politics is not only domestic policy in your politics, it's domestic politics, if you know what I mean. Thank you, Mr. President, for your thoughtful speech. You did flip through the history. You made a very nice context of today's Europe, but it urge you to be brave and give us your vision of how Europe would look like in 10 years, and particularly these two cool countries, Latvia and Estonia, within it. That's not the domestic policy. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we have, I, I said in the first three sentences, I'm not going to predict the future. Um, I mean, I would, uh, I mean, from an Estonian point of view, I would uh, prefer to see a digitized Europe so that if I am an Estonian, I get sick and I go to Greece, 
I stick in my ID card and the Greek doctor who obviously is not going to be able to read Estonian will have appear on his screen my entire health record in Greek. Um, I mean, I think that one of the things the EU should do much more of is actually focus on services to to citizens. I mean, this is quite different from big politics, but I think the way to the hearts and minds of Europeans is to focus on services for the citizens, and I think that the digital services are the way that Europe should go, and certainly in contrast to the United States, where they're, they're rather underdeveloped except for ways to pay money, uh, and certainly I would see Europe's approach to digitization as a uh, as the most serious and human form of digitization if you compare to what you see in the United States where there is no privacy and where anyone can sell anyone's data, or if you com compare to the social credit uh, monitoring system in that's coming in China where you can't do every anything without being monitored by by something and someone and big data analysis of who you're talking to and what you're doing and facial recognition of where you've been, all of those data are stored somewhere. So I see that that's, that's where we actually, Europe has a role to play. But that's more because my concerns are largely about digital things rather than other. Um, Certainly, we need to have a. Uh, d we w do need to really deal. And I mentioned this with our external borders. Uh, one of the things that, um, with all of this noise about refugees, um, if you, I did the calculations, uh, if you look at what UNRWA, the United Nations uh, Refugee Relief Agency, spent in 1945 to 48 on refugees in Europe. For example, Germany had 25 million refugees, of whom f half were not from Germany. The, uh, primarily financed by the US, then the UK, and Canada in that order, they spent roughly what today would be 50 billion euros. If you take 1945 US dollars, you know, go and Google it. What does it mean in 19, in 20, well, when I did it, 2016 euros, it comes out to 55 billion, roughly. I mean, it's a lot of money. But, you know, what are we spending? Like 3 billion, right? I mean, so we're not really dealing with these issues adequately. We don't want them to come here. Well, then we build things for them where they're coming from. That's what the U.S. did, and the Brits and the, and the Canadians, you know, let's pay for them, pay for them to live where they are. And it, it was <laughs> exactly the same calculus as we should be following today. Namely, unless we get this situation straightened out, if we don't get people living in places and working and having an economy, we're just going to see more communism, we're going to see more revolts, and we're going to see things spreading over Europe, that things that we don't want to see. But, they were, you know, people were smart enough between UNRWA, between the Marshall Plan and NATO to realize we have to do something and spend a lot of money, and that takes a lot of money. Right now, we are not spending the money and are unwilling to do so, but we whine and complain and moan and, wh and then whine and complain and moan about the rise of populace. Hello, I have a question to you as well. Um, you spoke a lot about freedom, and I think that nowadays freedom had become an empty word, just as sustainability. So if you don't know what to say, you say freedom or sustainability in every document. So my question is, what does this freedom uh, means to you? And are Estonia and Latvia still independent and free? Uh, because um, in my view, no, in the, in the circumstances when they are bound by so many uh, international uh, agreements and actually they can't decide that much anymore? Well, freedom generally is, uh, some, is a, uh, something you agree to limit your freedom because if you don't, you're ultimately free to go out and and punch 
someone in the face and they have the freedom to do it to you, you end up saying we don't do those kind of things and we're going to have police to prevent that. Um, since we've gone through the Soviet period and the deportations and the mass murders, uh, we give up a certain amount of sovereignty to prevent a re repeat of that. I just, it is completely unrealistic to, to think that living where we live, we can, we can survive in a way that we don't have to follow the rules. It's just not there. You can, you know, it's nice to be a libertarian living in the mountains of Idaho offline, uh, and people do, but it is not possible to live in Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania and say, we don't want a part of any kind of international obligations because we know what that leads to. And if you look at the fates of the countries that, you know, I mean, I was kind of nice in my speech, but basically, you know, the, uh, the countries that are not, you know, when, when, we be, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we worked at it. The countries that are invaded today and occupied in part by Russia are countries that did not work at it. And they, are they did not work at it, and now they are not able to be part of those international agreements. They're not part of that system. And I would say, um, I'd rather be part of the international system of the European Union and NATO than be in the position of Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova today. I mean, that's my personal belief. Sure, you give up certain things, but I want my children to grow up uh, not deported. Paldies par jūsu jautājumiem. Es domāju, mēs varam teikt arī paldies uh, Ilves kungam. Thank you, Mr. Ilves. Mr. Ilves, uh, thank you for your great speech and questions and answers set. And according to our traditions, we just give this more present. For, for, thank you. Paldies.